I wanted to just kind of uh, give you a little bit of an overview of what we are seeing and proposing as really kind of a national strategy for evaluating different soil health measurements, really with, with the goal of having a comprehensive soil health program that will really allow itself for national deployment. So here's kind of our situation analysis, I guess I would call it. There are a number of really well-established chemical and physical and some a handful of biological measurements that are really accepted. They've been used some of them for decades. These are the ones that we kind of refer to as the tier one measurements or indicators. But then there's a number of the other biological measurements in particular that are more contemporary. Uh, they just had not as much evaluation. There may be certain thresholds. We don't know how to interpret that threshold or may, they may have been evaluated in one region, not other regions. So those that we're describing as tier two or three that need this additional work done then there's several really promising evaluation programs, things like uh, SMAF, the Soil Management Assessment Framework, the Cornell test, uh, um, and uh, like the Haney test, and a number of others. There's some service laboratories and uh, universities that have their own uh, soil health evaluation program. But those do need additional testing and scaling up. And in my opinion, and this is, I guess, just my opinion, that none of those are really all that adequate at relating their results to what I consider are some of these key drivers to adoption, things like yield and economics. And none of them, in my opinion, really go that next step of relating those to things like water quality and greenhouse gas emissions. There, there's there's some, some of it's out there, and but some of it is quite nuanced, and um, it, it just seems like there needs to be a much more quantitative type of relationships built, essentially. Of course, we also know that one of our many challenges is that all these variations in soils and climate and management and production system, that they will influence that interpretation of those results. So bottom line is, is we really feel like that there needs to be a strategic, nationally coordinated approach. So this is really what we are proposing. And this is something that we were fortunate to receive a $1 million grant. And we partnered with the Nature Conservancy and the Soil Health Partnership. Uh, that is um, uh, sponsored by National Corn Growers Association. And uh, submitting a proposal to General Mills, uh, we were funded at two million bucks, and one million of that effort is going into this. And uh, we've yet to get some of it out the door because one of the first things we feel like that we really need to do is to develop a national catalog of all these long-term agricultural research sites. There are things like this, like the picture that shows you on the slide right here, where they are well replicated, they have valid experimental designs, they have long-term management histories, they have long-term climatic data, they've been taking yields. And I'll be the first to say that we're not saying that a yield on experimental plot is the same as a yield on a farm. We are not saying that at all. But what we are saying is that the management history of these, the experimental designs that exist in these, and the breadth of climatic zones that I'll show you here in a minute that are represented by all these across the country, offer that opportunity for evaluating many of these different soil health measures and then relating them to these ecosystem services like, well, like water quality, greenhouse gases, et cetera. So what we have done is we have issued a request um, for these long-term sites. Rob Myers is helping us uh, work on that. And um, we are going to be then using some of that funding. And we've uh, actually applied for a very significant amount of funding that we feel like is really needed for this effort. And to the extent that we are successful in that, we'll be getting it out the door in this way. So let me uh, just kind of start off here to kind of show you what the possibilities are. So here's a generalized map of the dominant soil orders across the United States. One of the things that we have is we have, when I say we, the collective we, right? The universe of those that care about this, this situation. These long-term agroecosystem research sites that ARS has pulled together. We also have these long-term ecological research sites that were funded by the National Science Foundation. Well-known management histories, climatic data. There's also a group called NEON, the National Ecological Observatory Network. That network of sites also exists. Then there's something called these critical zone observatories that the National Science Foundation has. So many of these, 
not all, many of them have these replicated experiments. Most of them didn't start off saying we're gonna compare soil health promoting versus non-soil health promoting, but many of them started off as we're gonna compare no-till and till. We're gonna compare, compare with and without cover crops. These things that we know are beneficial for enhancing soil health, so we can interpret them in, in that light. But here, here's the huge opportunity. There are also things like the GraceNet sites, the greenhouse gas reduction through agricultural carbon enhancement network sites, where they set up a status quo treatment versus more an aspirational treatment to reduce greenhouse gases. And sometimes they took it to another level than that. So what that does is that opens up the opportunity now to relate these soil health measures to some of these ecosystem services. In this case, increase carbon sequestration, reduce greenhouse gas emissions but it goes further than that. <laughs> Here are the conservation effects assessment project, watersheds, instrumented watersheds and subwatersheds where people have been evaluating things like nitrate and phosphorus, you know, both in the subsurface and in the surface runoff and relating that to those management practices in that subwatershed. Okay, so look at our opportunity here. When we combine all of these sites, look at that population. But guess, you know, it's kind of like one of those, uh, those uh, commercials on TV. But wait, there's more. <laughs> because think, think of what I have left out. All the land-grant university experiment sites. I mean, a few of them are, are, have been included, but most of them have not. And so that's one of the things that we are trying to do is we feel like that there's probably at least 200 or so of these types of experimental sites that are available that, that give us this opportunity. And so I would encourage you all and, um, to, to think about what that opportunity is in your state, your adjacent states, and to work with those individuals that are kind of the curators of those sites and or to reach out to them and make sure they are aware of, on our website, we have something set up called the Long-Term Agricultural Experiments Directory Project and ask them to contribute their information. We're only asking for a very small amount of information at this time because what we see as does our opportunity is now to then develop those networks. Once we get a catalog of all that database, now we say, okay, well, there's this network that's comparing till and no-till. There's this network that also is looking at cover crops, for example. And now we can go out and sample them one time, one time, and evaluate these tier one measures, the tier twos, the tier threes, these more comprehensive programs that, that I described, like the Cornell test and the Haney test and the SMAF test. We can evaluate them under those, really those control conditions. Again, not trying to interpret that this is exactly what's gonna happen on a farm, but trying to interpret what these best measures are that can be now nationally deployed and that can be related to these ecosystem services and true including economics and yield. And I should just also point out that this request is, is not just for the US, but also US, Canada, and Mexico. And, and so that's the request. Um, and so I wanted to make sure that you all are kind of new uh, of our push, what we see to be that strategic direction to really come to uh, a national agreement on what these best um, uh, soil health assessments are and really develop that program for national deployment. So I will um, turn it back over here to Steve Schaefer, who's gonna tell you a little bit about a survey that we ran on some of these measurements. Okay, I don't have to go into this uh, very much, uh, fortunately, because it's small type, uh, but this is a, a bullet by bullet uh, description of what, what, uh, these, what it means when we say tier one, tier two, tier three, but I think both Wayne and, and Dave have, uh, have laid that out very well. Uh, in a nutshell, the tier ones are measurements that everybody seems to be pretty comfortable with as, as indicators of soil health in some regard, and uh, we feel fairly confident uh, with uh, working with them. Uh, the tier twos and tier three, the, the twos in particular, um, are, are under development, are, are, are fairly well characterized in terms of what they're doing, uh, but perhaps we don't have exact data on thresholds or we, don't have, we haven't come to agreement uh, necessarily on the methods. And and the tier threes are uh, experimental. We know by you know, biological principles that uh, these things make sense, uh, but that they're not ready for prime time in terms of wide scale deployment in the field. So if you want to look at the blow by blow description of this, you have this uh, in, in the action plan. 
Now, one of the things that uh, we found in, find interesting is if we go back and we look at all of the activity that this specific community has been engaged in with respect to measurements over the last several years. So there's been the soil renaissance in which there's been research groups talk about this. There's been a measurement group talk about this. They've had some joint meetings there. Uh, we had the Soil Health Institute's first annual meeting last year in Louisville. It was Louisville, Doug. Um, and uh, uh, the interesting thing about that is, uh, from a scientific standpoint, is you don't always, ha always have the same group of people there every time. So uh, the, the good news about that is, is you don't fall into a rut. Uh, the bad news about that is, is you've always got a different combination of people coming in, and it's hard to figure out going, by going back and looking at the notes, what, is the, what are the consistent threads, you know, because the discussions were organized in different ways and so forth. So what we decided to do was just to go back and say, well, this community of, of, of people that we've got involved in the soil renaissance and now the institute, uh, uh, can we go back to those, those folks and just start asking them questions to see what kind of consensus we've got? So when we went back to uh, uh, the people who attended at least one of the uh, renaissance's uh, research working group meetings, or at least one um, uh, of the measurements working group meeting, or our annual meeting last year, and looked at that, um, we came up with 179 people that, that would fit one, of those, one or more of those meetings. Now, uh, we recognize that one or two of those folks might have forwarded our questionnaire to somebody else, but we'll, we'll, we'll take that into account. And the idea was simply to see what kind of consensus do we have just on the tier ones, uh, let alone the tier twos and threes, but do we, do we have a good consensus on uh, what we want to, want to say as a, a good tier one? And so we, we listed out uh, those uh, proposed tier ones that came out of the, the notes of those meetings, and we put those in our action plan. And we said, we think, we think these are good, good prospects. We didn't nail it down, we didn't set it in concrete, but we put it in the action plan that we feel like these are, are really good, strong candidates, and uh, we, need to, we need to come to a decision on that. And then we put that list out there in a, in a survey to these 179 people, and we asked these people that, to rate each one on a scale of one to 10, where one is don't, don't waste your time and money, this is useless, it doesn't tell you anything, uh, r relative to soil health, to uh, a rating of 10, which said, if you don't measure, measure this, you're really missing the boat, or you've got to have this indicator to help you interpret some of the others, but it's absolutely essential. So we uh, listed all of them out, and we asked people to rate each one of these on this scale from 1 to 10. And this is what we got. So this lists all the, all the indicators. And um, it shows you uh, several statistics on this. This is not a, a, a deep statistical analysis, but uh, this shows you how you can summarize this. Uh, the first thing that you'll notice is that every one of the indicators, the range is 1 to 10. So that tells you something about reaching cons true consensus. Um, uh, the good news about that is, is that, that people, people do have different opinions and different uh, viewpoints on this, and they were, not, they were not shy about giving those to us. Um, so let's step past that and go over to the median and the, and the mode and the mean. Uh, the mode here, you can see that uh, the most common measurement or the most common uh, rating on some of these was a 10, and the median was a 9, and I cheated on my significant di digits to look at the means. But uh, uh, you can see that there are some of those that uh, are quite strong. Uh, the ratings down the right side are not, are, you'll notice, are not like Duncan's multiple range test or anything like that. Uh, they're my gut feeling from looking at the data what, what I think we see when we look at this. And I, in my opinion, you could see that uh, organic carbon and pH and water stable aggregation, we really had pretty much universal agreement. Yeah, there's somebody in there that thinks these things are, well, they think all of them are useless. But uh, uh, there's, pretty, there's pretty good agreement on these that, um, that these are, are, uh, are very good tier ones. Uh, by the way, I should have mentioned we have 48 responses. Then you have a couple that I think, based on the, these, these uh, numbers here, we got very strong agreement. A fairly large group that I would still say, based on medians and modes of sevens and eights um, and, and means of this, is pretty, pretty clear consensus across the community that we have that these are, these are going to be uh, worthwhile uh, indicators. Uh, there's a couple of them that I would characterize as moderate to weak. Here we're getting down into you know, me medians and, and modes of six and eight and so forth. And then finally, micronutrients comes down here at the bottom with a median and, and mode of five, five, and 5.5, which I would consider the very definition of ambivalence. And uh, uh, that's probably the, the weakest one. But, but here's the thing, is that, uh, and this is what I thought was most important, N not one of these, uh, uh, in terms of the perspective of the community, 
um, is a reject. In other words, even the, even the weakest one, the one that you'd say, meh, uh, is, uh, is at least got, uh, is at least a middle of the road kind of, of a rating, and everything else is better than that. So uh, our feeling is, is that, uh, oh, let's see, I've got one more slide here I wanted to show you. The other thing we asked them is, oh, is, is there anything that should be on this list of tier ones that we, that we don't have? And the interesting thing about that was, there's more things that came back in that was, than what was on the list. Um, now some of these, um, some of these I think are, are really are on the list. There are some that maybe people just missed or, or something like that. Uh, some of them, I think, are in our tier two and tier three list. Things, these are things that we have are, and are supporting the development of them. I think there are some tier twos and threes in there. Some I would characterize as metadata, things like crop yield and manuring history, and, or I mean uh, crop yield hi history and so forth, or cropping history. Uh, I think those are, I would characterize those more as, as metadata than anything else. Some are unclear to me what they meant, you know, uh, like biology. Um, I sort of got a sense of what they, what they might be interested in, but exactly what dimension in there, I'm not sure. But I think, um, I, I think for the most part, uh, we, ha we are settling in as a, as a community on, uh, on the tier ones. Uh, the tier twos and th tier threes are still uh, objects of research and activity for, for the group. But as a community, I, I'm, I feel like uh, these are physical and chemical measurements that we, the community, uh, the soil science and, and practitioner and farming community know and love. They, uh, they know what they mean. They know in many respects how to, how to manage for them in one way or another. And uh, we're, we're coming to a, a sense that uh, these are meaningful tier ones. So I just thought I'd present the, uh, the outcome of this little survey that we did. Uh, this is not set in stone yet or anything. We've got, obviously got a good group to debate these things, but I feel like we've come, uh, we've come a long way in starting to, to really uh, settle in on, on what the tier ones should look like. That's applause for all of you. So sort of for Wayne a little bit on, on you're talking about that national assessment using all those long-term experimental sites. When, when you get down you know, uh, in a few iterations to the target areas, I think it would be highly beneficial. As you said, exper long-term experimental plots not, are not necessarily going to be exactly match our highest yielding, most productive working lands. But it'd be nice on the, uh, on the sites that were selected to also ask the PIs at those locations to identify one or two of their absolute best, highest yielding working farms to also collect a set of samples from. Because then it would be comparable to the replicated data that you're getting from these long-term sites and also, I think, in my opinion, be uh, very useful in helping us set some of the uh, threshold values uh, to what is achievable with known best management practices on specific soils under specific geographic locations. So it's kind of an add into your design. Mm -hmm. That's a very excellent uh, suggestion, Doug. We will definitely take that. Because I can see, as you were describing, I was envisioning that those on-farm, highly productive sites where they've done a really good job of managing it can essentially kind of serve as a, really kind of a calibration of, of what we had seen in the experimental sites that we know are not, you know, what you would find on a farm uh, because of many different management issues, um, including the plot size and stuff like that. So I, it's a really excellent suggestion. Thank you so much. So, so I have a, a two questions. The first one is for Wayne. Um, related to the long term, although this will sound kind of a weird question, what would be long term defined? But the reason for my question is that there are very few organic system longer term studies in certified organic farms. And that will make those long term experiments look like short terms or middle terms compared with the real mm -hmm. long terms of 40, 50 years maybe. Mm -hmm. So that would be the first kind of clarification. That is for Wayne. My second question is for Steve Schaefer. When I saw the ranking of the tier one, I kind of was surprised to see some of those, those uh, uh, very important properties ranked kind of in the lowest part of it. And my question would be, um, of course, this selection, the 179 people, 75, I don't remember well the number, was related to their own experience. Uh, but 
I know that if you read the literature, a lot of the differences that you may see in how important those properties will be to relate to soil health are going to be sampling methods and even scaling problems. So maybe if uh, we need to re, I would say I would look again the method of measuring those, uh, those properties, they will rank them so low or so high. Thank you. Thank you for your questions. Um, yeah, in terms of the long term, you know, we had to kind of make a, a decision on what we meant. And uh, we basically looked at what a number of studies have shown is that generally when you alter a lot of these management practices, it's often the first three to five years, it's kind of a transition period. And, uh, but then a lot of that depends on also the rotation. If you are in a two-year rotation, then you might need to double that. Or if you are in a, you know, a three-year rotation, it, it might be, you might need to double it or multiply it by two and a half times, or, you know, it's usually not three years. But, but my point is, is that looking at historically what the scientific literature has shown us, how long it takes through to get to that transition period before you can get measurable changes in soils and a lot of these soil health practice or um, properties, um, then we came up with 10 years. We said that we want these projects uh, to be uh, in place, have these management histories, these treatment comparisons for a minimum of 10 years with the hope that we will have much longer. Uh, also, that will be part of that database. But we kind of had to make a cut off a decision uh, that, um, that this is where it would be. Now, I will also say that there are situations that since we've embarked on this, that we've learned of a handful of situations where someone says, well, you know, we were doing this and that for 20 years and then we just changed, but we only made that change three years ago or five years ago. And we're like, well, you know, that, that can be some valuable information there too. And so we're not kicking it out uh, in that case. We're, we're including it too. <clears throat> Yeah, thanks for the, the, the prompt on uh, methods. We, I need to, oh, nope, Keith. Uh, just real quick, uh, maybe a plea. So when you guys go out and you sample and collect all this data from, I mean, it's a marvelous concept and, 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 uh, and great to see it happening. Uh, once the, you know, the publications and things, the initial ones come out, make sure that that data is, is all publicly available. You know, it no. will be so valuable for supporting, you know, all the scientists really globally. And, and I'm sure you're probably thinking of that, but I guess I'll, I'll take the opportunity to put you on the spot. But even more so, your next project, I think, is to take that whole network. And Doug Carlin had a, organized a meeting in Fort Collins last year where I think they laid out this vision. And that is, it's time now that we could take all these long-term experiments from ARS to, to uh, state universities and, and land grants and, and the LTERs and all that stuff together. It's, it's a big project, but you know, we need to, to bring all of that data together, the management data, the soil carbon measures we've been taken at the Marl plot since, you know, 1895, and it, you know, on down the line, and the yields and the management information and everything that's been collected there. And if we can pull that together and maintain that at some point online, uh, you know, for the scientific community to, to use, you know, this has been a vision that I think is, is probably 20 or 30 years old, but maybe the Soil Health Institute, together with your partners, can be the motivators, together with Doug and, and ARS and the thinking that's going on there. If that could happen sometime in the next, you know, two to three to five years, I think it would be a tremendous accomplishment because it's really a, a data rescue that, that we, you know, will be so valuable for all of this quantification that we're talking about. Yeah. Thank you. I think those are really good points. I guess one thing that I would just point out is that you've hit on a couple of the core principles for the Soil Health Institute and that it's not for us, it's for the greater community. And so one of our principles is transparency and another one's open source. And so uh, we fully intend to make that type of information available uh, to the extent possible. And uh, so we think that to a large extent it would be possible. There will be perhaps some uh, roadblocks that we run into every now and then uh, with privacy of data, um, but uh, we don't think those are insurmountable, I'll put it that way. Now, let me go back to measurement. 
Uh, yeah, one of the things that, that we, we discuss and, and struggle with is this uh, idea of measurement versus method. Uh, you know, the, the question of the survey was, is which measurements should be on the tier one list? Uh, we did not ask about method. And uh, just to give you an anecdote, probably the easiest thing to measure on that list is soil pH, right? Uh, but uh, if you ask 10 different people how to measure soil pH, you're going get, to get 10 different answers. And so that's, that's the challenge. Uh, uh, in terms of what's on the list, you know, it's like, it's like human health. You know, there's a whole big long list of things that your physician measures, and you, om if you say, well, you know, I can't afford this one, or my insurance won't pay for that one, you omit those sort of at your own, own risk, because what it does when you start taking them off, well, we're not going to measure this one, and we're not going to measure that one, what you get is uh, increasing uncertainty and limitation in the interpretive power and of what you can do with that information. Soil health is, is no different. Uh, methods need, will, will need to be region specific. Uh, let's face it, uh, the, 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 the process or the extractant that you might use for a, uh, a, a, a sandy mineral soil would not be the, the process that you would use for a high organic acidic soil. Uh, you'd, need to, you'd need to do even something like pH, you'd probably need to do those differently. The key will be uh, for any individual, uh, any individual person who, who's wanting, this, wanting these measurements or any organization is, to, is rigorous uh, incredibly rigorous standardization of procedures with very rigorous QAQC protocols that um, will, will ensure that, uh, that when you get data, you can interpret it relative to what you've seen in the past. You can interpret it with respect to the sites that you're interested in. But it may be that you know, the, the, the exact procedures that are used for uh, you know, a, a blueberry soil in Maine is not the procedures that you would want to use for corn soybean field in, in Iowa. So there's going to have to be some, some uh, regional contextual decisions on methods and interpretation. Uh, the survey was about what should be on the list. Oh, you mean ranks of the way things came out on that? Maybe, maybe. But I think what I conclude from this is, is like, you know, your physician's assessment of, of human health, there is a whole big long, there's a big long list of things that need to be measured. There's good consensus from everybody of what needs to be on that list. I think your point about what order it appears in would probably change, I agree. If you got a different 48 people, you'd probably come, you might come out with a different order. Um, but the things that are on the list, I think, are in good agreement, and you eliminate or you omit some at your peril. Good, good. So I guess I feel like we should probably close this out to kind of get back going, going on schedule. I would say that uh, this uh, uh, we're excited about the opportunity we think of getting all this type of input to give us that opportunity to move forward. Uh, with some of these that are relatively non-controversial, recognizing that some of these additional tier two and tier three type of measurements that need additional, additional work, there will always be that opportunity for conducting the work to bring them, elevate them essentially into that more tier one accepted uh, status. And so that's kind of what we're all about too, is trying to make sure that uh, this is a continually, a continual source of improvement uh, for our ability to describe soil health. So I would uh, now, I guess, like to use the opportunity to join into the next, go to the next session.